This Silver Cup represents a season of combat. It is awarded each year to the IndyCar champion. 58 have joined the fight. Four remain on top, led by Allinger Jr. The Albuquerque kid holds 163 points and searches for his second title. His sole victory this year was the biggest of his life, the Indy 500 and its million-dollar purse. But his road has not been easy. Like at Vancouver, he refuses to give up. Al recovered from this upset to finish second. Here at Nazareth in 1990, he slammed the wall. But he still took the championship that same day. Bobby Rahal has led the points most of the year. He arrives here one point back. Much of this season, he has been steady and unstoppable, always in the fight, often at the front. But lately, his racing luck has changed. A month ago at Vancouver, a fight for second sent Rahal into the wall and out of the race. Two weeks ago at Mid-Ohio, a mistake of inches gave Bobby another pointless day. The defending champion, Michael Andretti, arrived here third with 152 points. He added another by taking the pole. In the middle of this season, Michael ripped off a string of wins at Portland, Milwaukee, Toronto, and Vancouver. He's led twice as many laps as his nearest competitor. Looking for his second championship, Michael has broken 10 track records. There is no tougher driver in the series, but that's not always enough. Racing has played a role as it did with mechanical failure, leaving him by the roadside two weeks ago. Like Ray Hall, he failed to earn a point. The 89 IndyCar champion, Emerson Fittipaldi, is 18 points behind. Four races ago, he was considered out of the fight. But then, he took a series of wins. At the Burke Lakefront Airport in Cleveland, he drove steadily away from all challengers, breaking the qualifying and the track record. At the giant Road America circuit, he outclassed his teammate and the rest of the field to take the win and edge closer in the points. Two weeks ago, at Mid-Ohio, as other contenders fell out, Fittipaldi set another race record and put the Penske team back into the championship battle. Now, with over 3,000 racing miles behind them and just two races to go, four men reach for the PPG Cup and the IndyCar Championship at the Bosch Spark Plug Grand Prix. Race two coming up now, the Bosch IndyCar Grand Prix from the Nazareth circuit. Now, this is a track that the Andretti's know extremely well. They live in the area. They've uh, practiced and, and tested cars there for many, many years. Michael Andretti sitting on pole. But remember, Emerson Fittipaldi has won the last three of the four races. Bobby Rahal's consistency has fallen away a little bit toward the end of the season. And, of course, Little Al came from nowhere and leads the series by just one point. So points really vital tonight. Now, fuel is going to be very critical in this race because the track is so short, the speeds are so high, and uh, there's likely to be a lot of yellow flagging tonight because of the amount of traffic. Uh, the leaders will probably start tagging the tail enders by uh, at least lap six, seven, or eight in that area. So it's going to be a pretty exciting race and points, as I said, pretty vital. Can Andretti hold on? He would love to win the series before moving into Grand Prix Formula One racing. Little Al, he'd like to sort of now make his mark and take the championship. And Bobby Rahal, who's been so consistent, would love to really consolidate his point. Emerson Fittipaldi, as I said, a three-time winner. Can he make it four on the trot tonight? Let's take you now to Paul Page. Derek Daly, pictures coming out of ESPN. Here's the diehard starting grid. On the pole, it's Michael Andretti, the winner of this event in 1987 and the new track record holder. Alongside Emerson Fittipaldi, a back-to-back -back winner here at Nazareth in 89 and 90. In the second row, Bobby Rahal. He has two wins on one-mile ovals this season. And John Andretti with his best qualifying effort all year. In row three, Mario Andretti looking for his first win on his hometown track. And Scott Goodyear, the winner of the Michigan 500. In the fourth row, it's Scott Brayton, who finished third on the New Hampshire Mile in July, and Eddie Cheever, a runner-up on the Phoenix Mile back in April. In row number five, Paul Tracy, who ran second at Mid-Ohio in the most recent IndyCar event, and Scott Pruitt with nine top ten finishes this year. In the sixth row, Danny Sullivan, the 88 winner of this race, and Mike Groff making his second start in A.J. Boyd's car. In the seventh row, it's Al Unser Jr., leading the chase for the PPG Cup by a single point, and Raul Boisel with eight top ten efforts in 1992. In the eighth row, it's Ted Preface and Stefan Johansson. In row number nine, it's Al Unser, making his first Nazareth start since 1987. And Hiro Mashushka. 
Honda. In the 10th row, Buddy Lazier and Dennis Patolo. The 11th row is John Jones and Christian Danner. And alone in the 12th and final row is Guido Daco. Weather today couldn't be better. Sun being blocked by clouds, that will help adhesion to the track. The temperature is perfect for these turbocharged engines and there's no chance of rain. Looking over Allinger Jr.'s right shoulder, 200 laps lie ahead, 200 miles. Ari Leyendijk, the defending champion, is a spectator here today. Not racing in this field, but best indication is he may very soon announce a ride for next year. There's your pace car, the front row, not yet fully aligned. The rest of the field comes through. Pick out your champion. Allinger Jr., you can see, is well back and has much to overcome if he is to come forward and continue to be a contender in the PPG points fight. Now the pace car pulls off onto the pit road, a most unusual configuration here. They enter and leave the pits over on the back side of the race course. The pace picks up. We look for Nick Bonaro's green flag. The green flag comes out, and we are on the run. challenge John Andretti and coming alongside Fittipaldi there's Mario Mario moves down inside of Fittipaldi and Mario comes forward and absolutely forced the issue with Emerson muscles his way down under braking for turn three Emerson moved down realized Mario was too close and moved up but a great run and a great outside move by John Andretti at turn two Everybody held their breath on the start. That's the first time in four races that there has not been an incident on the opening lap of the run. John Andretti now coming up to challenge Bobby Rahal, who runs in second place. Michael continues to pull away from Rahal. And Andretti, John goes around the outside of Rahal. He tries it. John, who was apparently not satisfied with his car in some of the practice, now suddenly looking very strong as he moves around Ray Hall. Ray Hall back to third. John Andretti now into second and ready to challenge his cousin Michael. And a great qualifying run by John Andretti to start outside second row. Ray Hall did get the jump on him, but superb moves at his early stage by John Andretti. Maybe he really now likes that car, although on full tanks yesterday, he wasn't too happy with it. The leaders concerned about how soon they will encounter traffic on this course, many believing that by the seventh lap, they will already be overtaking the back of the field. We're on lap four, number one, right now, with the number one car, Michael Andretti, in front being chased by his cousin John. Bobby Rahal sits in third, followed by Mario, then Emerson Fittipaldi. Let's look once again at that pass, John Andretti. The nice move, here is Mario coming down inside of Emerson Fittipaldi and taking Fittipaldi as he comes forward and putting Fittipaldi back to fifth. The view back from Bobby Rahal's car through the suspension of the right rear wheel. And that replay definitely shows you. Oh, we're into, oh, we're into lap traffic already. Michael thinks he got blocked and raised his arms in frustration there. Things happen so fast here at Nazareth that even a driver moving out of the way can still cause the leading cars to have to back out of the power. Michael Andretti leads it. You can see traffic line ahead. Only three times in his career, in his last 27 starts, has Michael Andretti scored a victory on an oval. Scott Brayton, Paul Tracy, Cheever, all lining up. Seventh, eighth, and ninth place. Good fight. Cheever running ninth. Cheever was superb in qualifying, except... The car was very, very good, but he had a fuel pressure problem. He got out of the car absolutely furious because he believed he could have been on the front row of the grid here. Look at him, poke his nose down the inside of Paul Tracy. Now they, too, begin to encounter some slower traffic. But fortunately, it moves aside for him. Back from Scott Brayton's car. Here's Tracy coming to the outside. Oh, difficult He's move, gonna get difficult pinned. move. Oh, they're side by side still. Another gutsy move by Paul Tracy, and he's able to pull it off. So Tracy gets around Scott Brayton and into seventh place. Now it's Cheever that lines Brayton up. And he pulled the move off going into turn one, but it all started back at turns three and four. That's where Tracy made the commitment that we had great shots from behind Brayton's car. That's where he made the commitment to go around the outside. Now Cheever attacks Brayton. Eddie Cheever.
Schieber takes a look. Just behind Schieber is Scott Pruitt, the Crew Sports chassis. We have much to tell you about that chassis for next year. We'll cover that a little later in the show as we watch Scott Brayton trying to hold off a charging Eddie Cheever. Back to the front of the field, looking at Fittipaldi and Mario Andretti as they continue their fight. Well, you can see that Emerson actually did manage to squeeze back by Mario, has the tires now up to working temperature, so now he's on his way and on his charge trying to catch up to Ray Hall. Al Unser Jr. in a precarious position right now. The field is moving so quickly at the front, and he is battling with so much traffic that he is about six seconds away from being lapped. And look at Scott Goodyear. He's going to fill Mario's mirrors in just a couple of seconds. Goodyear closes up behind Mario Andretti, and Paul Tracy is beginning to close in as well, trying to catch Scott Goodyear. Now the two Canadians are in direct contact with one another. 13 laps are complete with Michael Andretti running at the front of the field in front of a hometown crowd looking for a victory and further points to a championship. Back at the Bosch Park Plug Grand Prix, Mario Andretti has two Canadians, Scott Goodyear and Paul Tracy lined up just behind him in an ongoing battle for fifth place. Fifteen laps now complete for the leader, Michael Andretti. Let's go pit side. Jan Bikas has this update. Well, speaking about Scott Goodyear, yesterday when he ran the car, the car got real loose in traffic. They decided to go with the Cascade wing. That's a double element rear wing. If you look carefully, you'll see it. Interesting, that's the same thing that Mario Andretti has chosen, as well as Michael Andretti. In other words, the guys have gone for the setup to run fast in traffic. Interestingly enough, Ray Hall and John Andretti do not have that. Maybe they will be falling back in traffic. Keep an eye on it, Paul. We're watching that battle right now. John Andretti and Bobby Ray Hall, the ongoing battle for second place. John Andretti with much on the line here because there is some suspicion that he might not be the chauffeur of this car next year. On the other hand, if he can turn in a series of good performances here at the end of the season, he might just be able to stay employed at Hall VDS. Well, there's nothing like a bit of pressure to bring the best out in a driver. That's what John Andretti does outside of Danny Sullivan, he goes. But my John Andretti was superb at Mid-Ohio and has been so far all this weekend, particularly in qualifying. As they move around Danny Sullivan, that might give you an indication of what Al Unser Jr. may come to expect during this day in a similar Galmer chassis. Similar but totally different. Alonzo Jr.'s car is one of the development cars for next year's regulations. Fundamentally a totally different feel of car. But Al Jr. had enough confidence in that car to say, yes, I think we should utilize a race weekend, even though it's difficult to continue the development of this car. Tremendous gamble in the points. Alonzo Jr. sitting back in the field in 16th place. There's Bobby Rahal taking a look inside of John Andretti once again. Oh, look at the traffic jam now ahead of John Andretti. That's the help Rahal needs. We heard Emerson say earlier on the traffic will be one of the major considerations here. And look, there is a traffic jam ahead of John Andretti. So now traffic will become the issue. That number four car is Al Unser, the senior, sitting in for Rick Mears. And look at this as they come three and four wide on the front stretch. And Ray Hall gets down inside of John Andretti. So Ray Hall back to second place. What you're seeing now is what oval track racing is all about. Two and three abreast racing, outside line, inside line. That's what makes this one mile oval track racing so special. Even people now like Stefan Johansson, who has no background in this, in this at all, thinks it is the best form of racing he has ever experienced. Well, it will certainly keep a driver busy because if you're not involved in a battle of your own, you're almost certainly overcoming traffic at some time as you fly around this little mile oval. We call it a mile. It's a little bit less than that. But for statistical purposes, they consider it a mile track. Michael Andretti, now five seconds out in front of Bobby Rahal. And the good news is, for a moment at least, he has clear sailing ahead. 24 laps are now complete. Now 
Now Fittipaldi closes down on John Andretti. A battle developing for third place. Let's go pit side, Gary Gerald. First car on pit road very early was Danny Sullivan. Car was extremely loose. They made a wicker bill change on the rear wing. He's back on course. They didn't want to come in this early, Paul. So the fight continues now within the traffic. John Andretti started fourth up to second for a while. Now back to third after that pass by Bobby Rahal right in the middle of traffic here at Pennsylvania International Raceway. Gigantic crowd here today. In fact, they delayed some of the opening ceremonies just to be able to try to accommodate the record crowd that poured in this track. Let's take a look back now. And Bobby Rahal made his move on John Andretti. And it is a traffic jam, but look at this. John Andretti commits himself to be behind the PIG car, but Rahal tries to slice down the inside, doesn't get it done there. Now John is slowed. He's slowed a little bit down on the inside line, and that gives Rahal the run. See Rahal on the power, on the power early, and gets him the slingshot down the inside of John Andretti. Does that say something additionally, Derek, about how well Rahal may be handling down low? Well, that's oh, again, we have and another Fittipaldi gets John Andretti. So John Andretti so strong at the start. With Fittipaldi moving up into third place, is slowly fading backwards. And now Paul Tracy is going to give him all the problems he needs, too. Tracy's in attack mode here. Look at Tracy. Tries the high line, the outside line, but John quickly blocks it. He moves up. Tracy darts to the inside. Gets alongside John. Very, very close. John now knows he's there, and Tracy is passed. So John Andretti, who was so solidly in second place just a few laps ago, is now back in fifth. And that Tracy-type move is so risky under braking down at turn three because remember, the end of that corner at 175 miles an hour. So if wheels touch at that type of speed... Oh, and Paul Tracy comes around, around Fittipaldi. Fittipaldi gets caught in traffic, but now Tracy is caught behind Al Unser Jr. as they try to lap him. And of course, little Al is not going to let anybody get past if he can avoid it at all. It's no move over. I'm a good guy on this race. It's too important in the points. Paul Tracy tries a high line to the outside. Gets alongside Al Unser Jr. And Tracy has passed. Now Fittipaldi has to handle him up. Well, Paul Tracy really, really has the bit between his teeth at the moment. But anticipating what traffic is going to do is half the secret to being successful on small ovals like this. So John Andretti back in the fight again as he tries to move to the outside of Al Unser and now is between the two Unsers, father and son. So John Andretti seems like there may in fact be a problem with this car, Gary Gerald. Indeed, Paul. They, I just checked with Jim Hall of Hall of EDS Racing. They picked up a push and so the car's not handling the way they'd hoped it would. And they're obviously paying a stiff price right now in all of this traffic. His move on Al Unser Jr. gets passed, but of course, lap traffic here at Nazareth, but it did hold John Andretti up for a bit. And when you pick up a push, the biggest disadvantage it is, is down at turns three and four, exactly where we saw Rahal slide down underneath John Andretti. When you have push, you cannot get the power on early enough. That's the disadvantage John has to have now. Father and son battle now. Al Unser in the four car moves inside the three car of Al Jr. It's a rotating battle for 13th place. Allinger Jr. back filling in for Rick Mears, who had already decided to sit out the season owing to his injury in his right wrist. The 200-mile record here, 148 miles an hour. They qualified and they're running at 166. Pennsylvania, some of the beautiful churches, the beautiful architecture around this very old part of the United States. And it's the Nazareth kid, Michael Andretti, that leads this field. Raul Boisel is now sitting just in front of Michael as he battles with Scott Pruitt. It's a battle for 10th place. That's the problem you have here. Bozell and Pruitt cannot back off and move out of the way too much, even though the leader is there. So there has to be a very subtle line adjustment between Pruitt and Bozell to allow Michael to get by. But look, they have their own personal battle going on. It's been a clean race thus far. We're 40 laps into it, 40 miles into it. 
first pit stops as we saw Scott Pruitt make a nice move there. First pit stops expected right after the 65th lap. And Bozell tried to poke his nose down the inside of Pruitt, didn't get the job done, and actually held up Michael. So Michael is being held up now by Raul Bozell. Michael Andretti drops back just a little bit. Sometimes that's a maneuver on an oval to get a surge forward and get going. But certainly in the points fight, Michael wants no part of any battle that might mean trouble for him. So Michael must tiptoe despite the fact that he is leading this race. There's the longest straight here at Nazareth, and it is not very long. You can see from all our pictures here just about, you're virtually turning the steering wheel all through the lap here at Nazareth. Paul Tracy in third continues his pursuit of Bobby Rahal and is in close contact with Rahal now and closing in. Ray Hall has been very powerful here on this oval in the practice. Was looking very strong in the Marlboro Challenge. On board now, the Quaker State on board camera of Scott Goodyear. Goodyear runs in sixth place. Goodyear has been so good on oval tracks this year. That's Al Unser Jr. He's trying to pass, comes right up behind him. Al Jr., you can see, is down on the low line. Now, Goodyear may try and go around the outside here. He's not close enough. This is a long uphill turn two. Remember the Indianapolis 500, first and second? Boy, if only Scott Goodyear could have pulled that little move off just before the finish line at Indianapolis. Let's ride with Scott Goodyear just a moment here. Look how these laps tick off. you're very very busy here all the time however did not get the car quite to his liking but it must still be an uphill battle and learning curve for Stefan to get on top of these difficult one mile ovals riding now with Scott Brayton the surge takes him forward a little bit he catches Al but can't get past him oh he gets past himself Mario slips by Mario Andretti moving down on the inside that Mario or Michael that came past him on the inside. Things happen so fast, Mario and Michael are actually running together on the racetrack. Michael Andretti leads this race. Take a look at Finipaldi there, and take a, take a look now at Scott, uh, at uh, Paul Tracy moving up on the back of Bobby Rahal. <laughs> now he comes to the outside, tries to split him. Behind them is Finipaldi, but the challenge is Tracy's given to Rahal. He gets caught in traffic, almost squeezed out of the traffic. And Tracy is brave. He is a man that will take a chance to try and slide down the inside, and Rahal knows that, so he has to try and protect his position. But remember, they're rounding turn two here at 145 miles an hour. Now some fast-moving traffic just ahead for both of them. Ray Hall will, of course, encounter it first. Scott Pruitt sees it, moves to the outside, lets Ray Hall through. But now Pruitt has Tracy behind him. Ray Hall moving out as we take a look at the race summary here with Michael Andretti leading all the way from the green flag. And Paul Tracy looking for room inside of Ray Hall, but Ray Hall sucks the door again. No cautions thus far, and look at that average speed at 165 miles an hour with last year's track record at 148 and a half. Paul Tracy, 23 years old, but he has over 3,000 miles of testing on this racetrack here for Penske. Paul Tracy working on second place, Bobby Rahal. Jan Bikas, you have an update. That's right, Paul. Now is when the calculations take place. We're in Scott Goodyear's pit. We are now checking in. 
We're about 20 laps from pit stops. What they're doing is they are checking not only the lap times, but the fuel to make sure everybody stays on their fuel schedule. They figure it all out by computer ahead of time. They keep a very close eye on the clipboards. About 20 laps, it's going to be frantic down here, Paul. And Jan, the whole point is that at the distance of this race, if you miss those two stops by much, you could put yourself into a three-stop race pretty quickly. Well, that's right, Paul. Remember, that was the outcome last year. We had a couple of people had to make those late race pit stops, and then Ari Leindyke did and surprised everybody and got the victory. Now, everyone knows you can do it in two stops. Ari Leindyke did it. They're trying to repeat that this year. Ray Hall released from the pressure for a moment. Michael Andretti continues his lead. Ari Leindyke did do it, but he did have help from a yellow flag. That makes a big difference here at Nazareth. Late race yellow. Michael Andretti looking for career win number 27. And there's out in front is Michael Andretti. That's the 30 car, John Jones, up against the barrier, and so all of the leaders will head for the pits. It's a little bit early, but it just may fit within the window. The yellow flag is out. There's Michael Andretti. The leader of the race is already in and out. Paul Tracy makes his stop. The rest of the top of the order of this field should make a stop, but then, Derek Daly, we're talking about a time in the race in which... Uh, see some tactics played. Some crews may opt in back, stay out, and hope for another. Well, in fact, Mario Andretti flew by here. He elected to stay out longer than everybody else, so he is playing a different game than Michael. But they usually factor in a yellow flag situation here because the fuel is so tight, it's difficult to go flat out for the full course of the race as we watch Al Unser make his stop nice and cleanly. So most of the field in the pits, the man who has not stopped, as we take a look at Mario making his stop and anticipated on pit road is Scott Goodyear. But remember, on his crew, Derek Walker and Lori Garish, both guys who know really how to cycle these stops. And look at Michael, he's saying, Fittipaldi, get back there, you don't belong in front of me. Michael's not happy with that one, and Michael gets the position. Michael knows well, maybe how to not. Use. There's still a nose there. Yeah. Michael knows how to use his in-car camera. He knows there's a lot of people watching that in-car camera, and he has a beef with Emerson at the moment. Mario Andretti going down a little bit on the backstretch. I think just looking to rotate into position. As Scott Goodyear, we were suggesting as we passed over the 60th lap, is one of the few in the field that have not stopped. And Michael's saying, no, 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 shaking his helmet. Look, he still thinks Emerson has done something wrong. So Emerson Fittipaldi trying to move into a position ahead of Michael Andretti. Michael's not going to have any of it. Well, the silly season is now in full bloom, but it's not just the drivers that are being chosen. Jan Bikas takes a look at the equipment decisions the owners are making these days. of year is when team owners make those final decisions on chassis and power plants for 1993. Now if you want top technology and engines, that choice would be either the Chevy Ilmore C or the Ford Cosworth XB. They both have similar programs in that they recommend a minimum of seven engines per driver and they ask you to enter into a lease program that's two years in length. The reason they do that, to amortize the cost of research and development over a longer period of time. Well, you may say, well, why lease engines? The reason you lease the engines is they want to protect the technology of these engines, and therefore, you don't own it, you can't take it apart. If something happens inside, this engine gets shipped back to Cosworth, where it's rebuilt. Then it's time to think about chassis. Well, if you're Roger Penske or you're Rick Gowis, you might choose to build your own chassis. But most people will go with the Lola. Then you have to decide, well, do I want two or three? Most teams will opt for three cars per driver. They cost $425,000 each, but it doesn't end there because most teams will spend as much as $100,000 outfitting this car just the way they want it. They might spend another $100,000 on the dash here, the telemetry, the data acquisition. All these costs we talk about, remember, that's only the capital cost. We haven't even mentioned the consumables. There's an old adage in racing, speed costs money, how fast do you want to go? Scott Goodyear has made his stop and as a result moves back into second place as we look at his onboard camera. 
take a look at the situation that set this yellow flag up. We'll be looking from Allenzer Jr.'s on-board camera because apparently he was lined up just behind the situation, Derek. This is turn two. It's the uphill left-hander. Oh, you can see John Jones simply loses the control of the car. The back end gets away from him, and he backs it into the outside wall. In slow motion now, Derek Daly watching the car just in front. It. Car's gone. Car's gone away from him, backs it into the wall, breaks the rear suspension and the wing, slides all the way down, and then actually comes across the racetrack, just missing Alan Sir Jr. And you just see, look at little Al as he just kind of glanced over to see the fate of John Jones. We are now under yellow. We continue that way with 64 laps complete in the Bosch Spark Plug Grand Prix in the run now we look at the rundown at 74 laps it has not changed because we are still under yellow but we should be coming back to a green flag condition very shortly and approaching the halfway point in the race for scott goodyear that change may be paying off he's the fastest lap thus far in the race at 174.7 miles an hour and there comes the green flag and we're back to running michael andretti leads bobby rahal there is rahal just behind him is paul tracy once again trying to make the move on the rahal with those pit stops there were some guys that suffered one of them was john andretti who fell back and mario andretti and look at john right there as he's alongside al Hunter jr and mario andretti benefited through those stops and was able to move up into fourth place well john andretti again in the opening lap stop for the restart drove around the outside of bozell and sliced down in under emerson fittipaldi so john andretti when the tires are cool or when there's heavy fuel low, this car is superb just behind Fittipaldi, there is Ray Hall. Fittipaldi, of course, trying to move. And look at Paul Tracy come around Ray Hall. All three of them battling there. Boy, what a tremendous fight this is. And, of course, Fittipaldi is trying desperately to make up a lap to get back on the leader lap. That's now Paul Tracy challenging his teammate. You're right. That's Emerson's key. He needed to catch Michael and try and get that lap back. He will be in real trouble if he gets into a fight with his teammate here. But Tracy was on the move earlier. You can't hold him back. Can Paul Tracy help Fittipaldi in any way at this point? No, I think Paul has to worry about his own race and his own race only. Forget about Emerson. Paul needs to catch Michael because he can win this race. Paul Tracy can win this event. What Paul Tracy must worry about right now is third place Bobby Rahal sitting just behind him. And Rahal can't be happy with having that young fellow dart around him that quickly. Most of the cars still running heavy loads because they all stopped for fuel and tires. Their first stop of the day under the caution flag. The caution, of course, for John Jones. Best indications are that he is okay as a result of his altercation with the wall. And Bozell running very strongly here after his pit stop. He's only in 11th place, but you can see that he has the speed to stay ahead of Emerson Fittipaldi because Fittipaldi has not made a lunge or an attempt to pass Bozell yet. Michael Andretti got a good restart is pulling 6.6 seconds ahead of the second place car of Paul Tracy. Separating them is Emerson Fittipaldi and Bobby Rahal continues to work on Paul Tracy for second. Oh, John look. Andretti almost cuts the front end off of Cheever's car. Darts down inside of Scott Pruitt. John Andretti is making such decisive moves here, particularly in traffic. We haven't seen a confidence level in John like this on an oval track this year, but John Andretti certainly putting on display a brave, decisive moves here, which is very necessary on an oval. But look at the traffic jam again behind. Tracy Rahal continue to fight. Well, I don't know what happened there, but Bozell is either in trouble or he decided to just let that complete train go ahead of him. Sudden move by Bozell. By the way, Al Unser Jr., if you're keeping track of him, remember he came into this race as the points leader, and there he is. He runs now in 12th place. That's the last points paying position, and his dad is worrying him to death. Learning curve for Al Jr. This car fundamentally totally different to the Galmer car he has raced all year. It is the, the development car for next year. Uh, it's a brave decision to make to develop this car during this weekend considering the points battle. But I think that shows the confidence Al Jr. had in this car that he would actually take that decision. 
Just behind him is his father sitting in for Rick Mears. Now, Derek, can his father watch that car? And when this is all over, say, Al, I was watching this or that on you. Here's something you might want to consider. I, I don't think so in this day and age. These cars are so fast, you see so little suspension movement. These cars either have grip or they don't. You cannot really see a lot of movement in the cars in, the, in this day and age. So really, I don't think it can be of much benefit. So the way they judge what they need to change on that car, as well as most of them, is what the driver tells them and then what the computers tell them. Exactly, and the computer is the only thing that doesn't lie. You wouldn't suggest that a driver might not tell you. I never suggested that. All the drivers saying, oh, yeah, absolutely. I'm flat all the way around here until they show them the computer tape. Raul Boisel battling now with Scott Pruitt. It's an ongoing battle for 10th place. Scott Pruitt in that true sports chassis that Bobby Rahal thinks so much of. He has announced that next year his chassis will be the true sports chassis. He's already hired its designer, and he will be working with that chassis for the 1993 season. At one point in this season, Michael Andretti was 58 points behind in the championship chase. Now he is right up at the front. Quickly approaching the halfway point now in the Bosch Park Plug Grand Prix at Pennsylvania International Raceway. A 200-mile run. Shelly Unser concerned for her husband, who still runs back in 12, the last point-paying position. At the front of the field, it's Michael Andretti, chased by Paul Tracy. Bobby Ray Hall is third. Mario Andretti is fourth in front of his hometown crowd. And Scott Goodyear sits now in fifth place. Fittipaldi remains in the position of trying to unlap himself. But to do so, he has quite a battle. He must get around Michael Andretti, who is well ahead on the race course. And right now, he's actually involved in a fight with Bobby Rahal. Well, the only thing that can help Emerson, from what we can see now with the speed he can run, is another yellow flag situation. If he can get a yellow and catch it properly and make up that lap, that is the only thing that will get him back on pace with Michael and the leaders, because look, he doesn't have the speed. Look at Rahal, he tries to slice down the inside. That's the only area you can pass here, almost the only area, because that's where they get on the brakes, but the high line is so fast that it's very difficult to actually outbreak somebody and pull the pass off. Look at John again. This is the patented Andretti outside line, but now it's John instead of the usual Michael. Fittipaldi comes around, Bozell as well, continues his pursuit. This is a Penske-owned and operated track, and because of that, look at this traffic with Scott Goodyear and Michael. Because of that fact, it is a track that they test on a great deal. They have a lot of opportunity to test, and so Fittipaldi should have the best settings on this circuit. But right now, it's Michael Andretti that's looking so very strong here. Mario's not that happy with this car. He's not as confident entering corners as Michael is. So I'm sure you'll see Michael slice by Mario. I'm sure in the past he would never back off and let anybody by. But I'm sure for Michael's championship hunt, he will make it easy for him. Can't you imagine how much the crowd is enjoying, though, seeing father and son race it out? Former Formula One champion, one who aspires to be one as he moves to Formula One next season. Let's go down pit side. Jan Bikas is with the car owner for both Danny Sullivan and Little Al. We're with Rick Gallus, and Rick, Al Jr. now is in the final points paying position. Can you do anything else to get him up to speed? Did the, the changes you make in the pit stop help? Well, it helped a little bit, uh, Jan, but, uh, you know, we're just not working today, and, and it's a new car, and uh, we just... We're just uh, trying to make it better and trying to hang in there and get a few points so we can at least make a run out of at Laguna. Well, you know, you do have another pit stop. Is it possible you could get it that much more up to speed and then start cranking through the field? Well, we're going to keep trying. I mean, we're not going to give up, and we did help with this last time. We upped it since yesterday, so we need a few more tests, and we'll be okay. <laughs> do you have any idea whether you use this car at Laguna Seca? W what's that? Do you have any idea whether you will use this car at Laguna Seca? No, we're going we're gonna to wait and evaluate everything and see what happens. Thank you, Rick. Paul? Michael Andretti still in front. You saw them cycle around Christian Danner there. 
Bobby Ray Hall still pursuing Paul Tracy for second place. Emerson Fittipaldi in the midst of that as Ray Hall for a moment there looked to go around Fittipaldi. Fittipaldi is running out of the sequence, one lap behind the leaders. Fittipaldi currently in seventh place. Buddy Lazier on the Viper car moves to the outside, allows Ray Hall and Fittipaldi to go through. It's good to see that with the young new drivers because these leaders are traveling so much faster and need that fast line all the time to continue their fight. For Emerson Fittipaldi in the five car, this is a must-win situation today. After spending last weekend at the Formula One race in Portugal, we ask Emo what he thinks Nigel Mansell's expectations are in making the transition to the Indy cars. Yeah, he's very excited about the idea to come to IndyCar Racing. Uh, uh, he's looking forward to being a new challenge for Nigel. Being the Formula One World Champion, the defending champion, he'll, be, he'll have a lot of pressure. I think for us it'd be great to have Nigel. And he, for sure, he's concerned with the oval track. I mean, the transition from road circuit to oval. But Nigel's very talented. Uh, with Mario Andretti, he's going to get a lot of experience from Mario. Uh, you know, good team with Newman Haas. He'll be in good hands and he should be doing really well. And speaking of things Formula One, Formula One, we're sad to tell you that the great Formula One champion, the Bear, Denny Hume, succumbed to a heart attack while racing at Bathurst. Denny Hume passes away. Another great champion goes by the wayside. We enjoyed him so much when he came to the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. He had his stint in the Indy cars. He loved them. And even though he was in his 60s, never slowed down. His travel schedule was as hectic as it ever was, and he still enjoyed racing cars right up to the end. Michael Andretti runs in front, runs at a record pace. 162 miles an hour, his last lap. And look there, Al Unser. Right there with Michael Andretti. That's what we mentioned earlier, that high line. You can get on the power and cut down across somebody who's trying to get under you under braking. Now, we know Michael is much faster than Al Unser, yet it's difficult to actually make the pass. Here's the same area here, the downhill run. He's not close enough this time. Al Unser is getting, uh, getting a lot of coaching this weekend from Rick Mears, who is here, has been watching him, been helping Al with that car. They were talking about it, and in fact, Al seemed concerned about some of the setup on it. And it was fun watching Rick Mears, again, with all of those hand gestures, say, well, if you roll out here and get into it a little early here, and then Al comes back and says, okay, that works, what's next? But look at Scott Goodyear, Paul. He is all over Michael Andretti. Still has fastest lap of this race. He is one lap down, however. So Goodyear now is in almost an Emerson Fittipaldi similar position. He needs to claw his way by Michael. Let's get a further update on Big Al from Gary Gerald. Big Al likes the way the car is working, Paul. The only thing he doesn't like is the fact that they've lost their radio communication. Now they've had to rely on the pit board. It went out just prior to that yellow, and that was the scramble into the pits. They would have left him out there to pack up with the field, then brought him in afterwards, but it didn't work that way. 112 left complete. The yellow flag comes out. Indication that Ted Prappas's car was throwing smoke and oil at the back end, so the yellow is out. There's that car. That will slow the field. And Michael, who has led so well, has clinched the single bonus point. Shoot. Isn't it? Rolling on to the pit road. Strategy being played here as he accelerates and heads for his pits. And now Emerson and Scott Goodyear need to stay on the racetrack, come all the way around again, get back on the same lap as Michael before they make a decision about their pit stop. Here's Jan Vikas. We're with Mike Blandretti. They are taking the last few hits of fuel here, trying to get every last bit in. Looks Paul's in. Uh oh, they have a problem with the right rear, Paul. This is a long, long stop. Cars are going by on the racetrack. This could be very, very costly. Oh, Paul, they're just... rear tire was the problem the nut was stuck they kept just hammering and hammering finally finally they got it on 25 
8.3 seconds in the pits. An incredibly frustrating time for Michael Andretti, who is already pumped up with adrenaline at the run. Time moves so slowly for him in the pits, and Emerson Fittipaldi got back onto the lead lap with that long stop. Ray Hall's in the pits. Here's Gary. Bobby Ray Hall's team hoping to take advantage of that long stop by Michael Andretti. They make what appears to be a routine change, and it's a good one. Under 10 seconds on our clock, an amazing stop for Bobby Ray Hall. You see a man there that wants the championship, and as a matter of fact, as the position shuffle this day, it is Ray Hall that's picking up the points advantage because he is in a position, if he remains where he is to the end of the race, to grab the points lead back once again. We are under yellow again while they check the circuit because of some leakage shown at the back of Ted Prappas' machine. On any racetrack, especially an oval, you can't afford any oil on the track whatsoever. These pit stops, though, under yellow, come at the 116th lap. There's John Andretti in the pits. John was running in seventh place prior to coming in here. Hoping to keep his chair at Hall VDS Racing and keep that Pennzoil Pennzoil car as his steed for next year. And under the yellow thus far, Paul Tracy has not made a stop. And because of that, Paul Tracy is the leader of the race. Mario Andretti has stopped. Bobby Rahal has stopped. There's Ted Prappas' car as they check it over for lost fluid at the back of the machine. And Ted Prappas looks down on the car. Scott Goodyear has not stopped. Mario Andretti has not stopped. Emerson Fittipaldi, of course, has not stopped. So this yellow changes the complexion of this race once again. Derek Daly at 117 laps. I'm not going to run to the finish of this race. Roger Penske is betting on going a little further with Tracy and keeping him in front. Yes, and when you have three cars in a race, you can take a gamble and try and cover all bases, and that's what Roger Penske is trying to do. But Scott Goodyear, we see him there. He needed Tracy to stop, and then Scott Goodyear had a chance to get back on the lead lap. There's the green flag once again, and it's Paul Tracy that will lead this field around as we go green, and Michael Andretti now must catch Paul Tracy. He's back in that traffic about five seconds behind the leader of the race in car number seven. Official scoring now reporting down as we've got a car spinning coming off of the corner, and everybody scrambles to try and miss him, and John Andretti gets him. Dennis Vitolo spun coming out of turn two and almost got away with it. Poor John Andretti had nowhere to go because of the traffic jam and plowed into Dennis Vitolo. Vitolo was so hopeful of a good ride here today. Good new sponsor in Edge that they say is very successful in the Indy cars. A quick loss of traction. New tires, you think? Oh, it, it definitely could be a cool tire situation. Get, a, get hard on the power. That's exactly the same place as we saw John Jones lose control earlier on. But John Andretti, we see him here. I will be shocked if he can continue on. But we get a chance to look again. Look at the top of your screen, the black car. This is the edge-backed car, Dennis Vitolo. Now he's a, he gets away with it here. But look at John. Absolutely into the back of him, lifts the car off the ground. A shame for Dennis Vitolo because, as you said, they just had the most successful promotion ever for the Edge products using IndyCar Racing, but now the uh, the rest of the racing day is over. Jim Hall pats John Andretti on the back. He is obviously just furious with that situation. He had no option whatsoever. Look at his helmet. I thought that that wheel was very close as he passed underneath Dennis Vitolo. He was running so well, qualified, best of the season. Now, watch the car as John passes under it. There's Dennis, loses it under power. Now he does a 180, now the rest of, now he gets it back straight again. Looks as if it's clear. But remember, John Andretti's doing 160 miles an hour, has nowhere to go. You know that John Andretti's helmet hit the rear tire of Dennis Vitolo? I'm so very surprised that John was not hurt. Let's go to Gary. Well, we're looking at the helmet of John Andretti. You can see the rubber mark here on the left side right across the top. That's how close it was. John is here with a helmet off. And my friend, that's so scary when that situation happens. And I know it, it happens so quick at this place. But obviously, you appear to be all right. 
Yeah, I'm just, um, I'm upset, you know what I mean? Um, you know, unfortunately, the, you know, the guy didn't spin on purpose, and, um, but when he did it, everybody scattered, and um, the track's, you know, very narrow and very quick, and, and when I came up in, I, I just stood on the brakes, and I went for the opening, and unfortunately, the opening, um, the farthest opening was, was the guy that was going the slowest, um, the guy that just spun, and I, and he came all the way up over the car, and I hit him in the tire. I thought I'd be the softest way. I know it's got to be such a disappointment. This was the best qualifying effort of your career, and the car was running so good early, then I guess you got a little bit of a push, but you were hanging in so doggone well. Yeah, I mean, every every race is important, and obviously the, these ending races are real important for the points, and, and we had some of the people handle, and we were going to move up in the points, and, um, you know, but it's ands and buts, you know. They don't do much for you, but um, we'll be back at Laguna, and we'll put the yellow car at the front. We're just happy you're all right, John. Thank you. I'm always okay. <laughs> all right. Let's go to Jan Bikas. We're standing by with Roger Penske. Roger, you elected not to pit with Paul Tracy. What's the reason? Well, I think that uh, it's, it's not the winner. We didn't want to have to make an extra stop. Everybody else is going to have to make one. And at this point, track position is most important. I think that uh, we'll just wait and see. There's still about 80 laps to go. Okay, so when Michael came in, why would you say that he would come in? He didn't need to, then therefore he may have wanted to wait just like you for that fuel window to open? Well, he, did, he didn't come in immediately, then he came in the next time, and it was better for us to stay out. It gave us track position because it's so important with the traffic. Okay, we'll be keeping an eye on you down here at the Penske pit when that window does open. Paul? And his driver, Paul Tracy, at the front of the order now, has not stopped as we watch Scott Brayton get some routine service in the pits here at Pennsylvania International. Paul Tracy in front. Michael Andretti now plays catch-up. The Boss Park Plug Grand Prix is still under yellow. There's the leader, Paul Tracy. 125 laps are complete. This yellow came out shortly after one a little bit earlier for Ted Prappas, who was spraying some fluid on the track. And then on the restart, Dennis Vitolo's back end came loose and set up a most interesting situation. This is Vitolo. He loses control. Now it's a simple spin at the moment. Remember, at the top of the screen, there's John Andretti coming into view. He's doing 170 miles an hour. Now, if you stop it right here, right there, now look, John Andretti cannot see where Vitolo is. However, Bozell can see it and Cheever can see it. Cheever goes off to the inside. Now, watch when it clears here. Look, John has nowhere to go. Locks the brakes right there. Just look at this impact. Look how high Vitolo's car comes off the ground. Huge impact. Both Dennis Vitolo and John Andretti very lucky to walk away from this accident. Here is Emerson Fittipaldi back into the pits for Penske service. All four tires come off of that car. Let's go to Gary Gerald. Hoping to get that lap back. Emerson nodding to a radio communication. He's off the jack. Here's another excellent stop, but a little slow pulling away, just under 12 seconds as we go to Jan Bikas. We're standing by with Derek Walker. And Derek, that was a big advantage for you because you were just ahead of the leader, Paul Tracy, and you got to come all the way around so you won't go down a lap. So that was a big advantage. But you also came in and got fuel. Can you make it to the end? Well, it'll be touch and go. Depends how quick a pace it is. But obviously, with a little bit of fuel this bit later, it gives us a chance to stretch a little bit longer. And maybe there'll be a yellow and it'll be safe. But, um, you know, we're just going to wing it to see what happens. Now, when he came in under yellow, you don't have radio communication. Were you able to sort out the chassis deal when you made that change before, uncertain of whether that's what he wanted? Well, it's a, it's a bit of hand signals. So we think we, we know what he wants. He's running pretty quick on the track. So I think we're making the right decisions. If you're up front, will you gamble and not make a final stop? Um, well, we're going to go for as fast and as high as we can get on the grid. So uh, I don't know. We'll have to play that out when it happens. Thank you, Derek. Paul? Scott Goodyear still scored with the fastest single lap of this race at 174.7 miles an hour. Now, Gary Gerald is with Bobby Rahal's co-owner, Carl Hogan. And yeah, indeed, Carl keeping a very close eye on all of this. And I, I suppose the key question here, because of that earlier yellow, you came in for your second stop. Can you go the distance, or are you going to have to come back in and make a final stop for fuel? No, actually, if we do have three or four more yellow laps, I think we can, if we run conservatively, we can make it to the end. So it sort of depends upon what we've got now. And, and so um, the next three or four laps are going to be crucial. If we still have yellow without four laps, we're going to try to go without a stop. Is that a big gamble at this point? Uh, I don't think so. We've been getting very good fuel mileage, and if we can continue to do that, I think we'll be fine. Boy, you don't want to miscalculate in this championship battle, do you? 
Don't scare me, Gary. All right, Carl Hogan, they sweat just a little bit, Paul. And the operative words there, I think. There's a lot of thinking going on. It looks like there's a possibility of a splash and go for many guys right at the end. The reason Carl Hogan wants three or four more laps under yellow is under racing conditions, they'll do 1.8 miles to the gallon. Under yellow flag situations, they'll do as many as six miles to the gallon. That's why he wants more yellow flag laps. Roger Penske continues to watch and communicate with his cars. Paul Tracy at the front of the field, a gamble there because Paul Tracy has not stopped. Al Unser Jr. now comes into the pits, past the disabled John Andretti car. Little Al running in 11th place. He's moved up one with John Andretti's removal from the top of the order. And they get just a splash of fuel. Pennsylvania International Raceway. The pace begins to quicken as the green flag comes out again. And it's Paul Tracy going to try to hold off Michael Andretti. Michael Andretti desperately looking for points in the battle for the PPG Cup, the symbol of the IndyCar Championship. There's Bobby Rahal just behind Michael as two. That is the other player in the championship at this moment. Allinger Jr. sits back in 11th place, so they top the car off with fuel just before they went green. So apparently they're giving some thought for running all the way to the finish. And it is a gamble, but however, in this situation with two yellows, you got to go with the gamble, because you still don't know what's going to happen. But Tracy leads, there he is there. So Michael and Rahar are, are almost the full distance of the racetrack behind, almost a full lap. Looking back from the mirror cam in Michael's car, 68 laps yet to go in the run. That might be stretching the fuel window just a little bit. Paul Tracy out in front there you see first second third and Paul Tracy though there by the fact that he has only completed one stop a gamble being played by Roger Penske and Derek he's awful good at it the Valvoline race summary after 125 laps the speed falling off greatly with those yellow yellow caution periods three of them record speed here is 148.5 miles an hour so Paul Tracy leaves, and he, his fate is now in Roger Penske's hands. Remember, Paul Tracy will just do what he's told out in the racetrack, leaves all, leaves all the decisions to Roger Penske, and it will be nerve-wracking as his girlfriend watches Tracy again leading a race. I think he's led almost every race he's been in with, uh, with Roger Penske. Paul's had a spectacular season thus far this year, but he's at the point now where he must keep an eye on his own dashboard. He's got that marvelous computer display in front of him, and he can reach up and from time to time change the different settings and readings. But the pits, because of telemetry, are looking at vastly similar readings but they've got a calculator and a computer and they can they can project just a little bit further so he can't he, he almost has to ignore what's happening in front of him and something we mentioned about Tracy he is so aggressive he flew off the road so many times at Elkhart Lake but suddenly he was impeccable at mid-Ohio and has been impeccable here all weekend so a good consistent run and uh, showing Roger Penske that he is learning very quickly Further update on Paul Tracy. Here's Jan. That's right, Paul. Remember, this is Roger Penske's racetrack, and Paul Tracy has done 2,800 miles of testing here. And when you talked about computers, Roger Penske has the top-of-the-line computers. They know exactly what's going on. The fact that Roger Penske did not bring Paul Tracy in would lead us to believe that all those people that made pit stops cannot make it, because if that were the case, Roger Penske, the strategician that he is, would definitely have brought Paul in. We're going to be waiting when he does make that decision. Paul? Michael Andretti now runs 3.4 seconds behind Paul Tracy. Paul Tracy with a lighter fuel load by a large margin as we take a look at Scott Pruitt continuing his battle with Eddie Cheever. That's a battle for eighth place. Were you surprised, Derek Daly, when they announced that Ray Hall would be using this True Sports chassis that uh, Scott Pruitt has now next year? It seems like quite a gamble as well. Um, it is a gamble when you do something like that. I think everybody was surprised because there was no inkling at all that that would happen. However, the mysterious test that took place at Mid-Ohio several months back was, in fact, Ray Hall. Oh, Scott tries to slide down the inside of Mike Schuster. Wheel to wheel there, it gets the job done, but it was Ray Hall who did that test. He was very impressed with it. And 
then of course uh, Stefan Johansson tested the car he was very impressed that probably helped Ray Hall make that critical decision another driver had a good test at Mid Ohio was Scott Sharp in one of Derek Walker's cars and they were very pleased with him let's go down to Gary Carroll well, Danny Sullivan has called it quits for the day. An ill-handling race car, and I guess you just kind of want to get out of the way. Well, we, we had a, looks like a shock broken, and so, which makes it ill-handling, and, uh, you know, I'm just in the way. I'm 17th. Nobody's really dropping out of the thing. Um, these guys got a race and a championship to go. There's no point just to vlog around and maybe cause somebody some harm. I had a couple big moments on the last lap, you know, just where you get it sideways. There's uh, no point. We've already backed one in the wall this weekend. We don't need to do another one. Well, earlier in the week, you mentioned into the wall, and let's pull down here. Here's a computer graph of that lap. You see the ride for Danny Sullivan, and then you see this dramatic spike mark. That's when he impacted the wall. Ten negative Gs on the de deacceleration right there. And then a secondary hit, five negative Gs. And boy, that hurts a lot, right, Danny? Well, it gives you a pretty big he headache, but I got to say, the Galmer held up really, really well. It took the impact. I walked away from it, and as I said, just had a headache for a couple of days, but uh, everything was was good the way the car held up. Thank you, Danny. Thank you. Paul? And if you look at the finer measurements of that graph that Gary showed you there, it went from 1G to 10Gs in 0.8 of a second, so a big impact for Danny Sullivan. You know, another accident, not here at Nazareth, but in testing for the final race of the season, happened to the man we're riding with right now, Michael Andretti. He had a throttle stuck as he came down through the corkscrew and went right off into the barriers. Here are your points leaders and where they run at the moment. And if the race points were to be awarded at this moment, Bobby Rahal would have a six-point lead on Michael Andretti. Al Unser Jr. would still be in that fight. Fittipaldi must improve if he intends to be. So we're watching now for Paul Tracy do any time. By the way, within this team, Betty Rutherford and Chris Mears have been working on caring for baby with AIDS. They got everybody as a care of benevolent charity to help them this week pledge money for individual drivers in laps at this race. So they're taking on a charitable cause. Paul Tracy makes his turn into the pits. 148 laps are complete. He relinquishes the lead as he does so, and let's go to Jan Vigas. Paul Tracy brings it to a stop. They kept this very guarded, Paul. They did not show him on the pit board. It was all done by radio communication. The wheels are going on. Now for Paul Tracy, watch for the air coming down the hose. He has to get all the fuel in. We did not see it. He's underway. He's out of here, Paul. 12.6 seconds, and Paul Tracy is on the roll. And what he's trying to do now is get out and get up to speed before Michael comes around, because if Michael can catch him, he can put him a lap down. There's Michael at the top of the screen. Michael just behind him. Michael, of course, took the lead, does not put Paul Tracy a lap down, so Tracy remains on the leader lap. Second place is now assumed with that stop by Bobby Rahal. Scott Goodyear comes up to third place. So with Paul Tracy's stop, the complexion of this race changes entirely. Michael Andretti moves back to the front, and the championship battle between he and Ray Hall continues. In the Bosch Park Plug Grand Prix at Nazareth, Pennsylvania International Raceway, a track rebuilt by Roger Penske, but Michael Andretti in front of his hometown crowd is back as the dominant factor. When Paul Tracy made his pit stop, Michael moved back to the lead again. Roger Penske taking a gamble, hoping for an additional caution period that did not manifest itself. And as a result, Paul Tracy made a stop under the green, and now Michael Andretti is at the lead of the race with Bobby Rahal three and a half seconds behind. And if you listen to the throttle movements here, Michael hardly lifted when he passed Danner. This is turn two. He just rides the brakes down here, just a little bit. Well, you can hear those tires squeal. Hear those front tires squeal. Ooh, listen to the song of Goodyear. That's Emerson he's chasing. That's Emerson Fittipaldi right ahead of him. And there's Groff. Terrible break for Paul Tracy because look here. The yellow almost certainly and in fact does come out 
If Paul Tracy could have only stretched this far, you can see there's water pulling out of the point out of the side there by the coolers. And Michael Andretti is going to roll into the pits. This may be a break for Paul Tracy in the other direction now. This could be a huge break for Paul Tracy. He's got all the fuel he needs, and he's about to take the lead. Michael Andretti roars out of the pits. Paul Tracy moving on the main stretch under the yellow. And Michael Andretti does not want to get lapped, doesn't want to get bottled up behind that Penske car in front of him. The pace car is out, and there's Paul Tracy. Johnny Rutherford at the wheel of the pace car will slow this field down. And that gamble that Roger played now looks fairly bright, but look at Tracy. Tracy is going to go to the pits as well. So Paul Tracy will go in. They'll top this car off with fuel, and that will mean that our leaders of the race at least will have plenty of fuel now to go to the end of the run. Well, something did not go right in the last stop for Paul Tracy because he should have had all the fuel that was in that tank. And all it is is fuel as Paul Tracy spins those rear wheels out of the pits. 7.2 seconds, maybe in fact a time stop. Jan Vegas. Well, Paul, remember when we watched Paul Tracy stop a few minutes ago, and I said, watch the fuel hose and watch for air. We didn't see the air. In other words, they did not get all the fuel in the fuel tank in the pits, in the fuel tank in the car. So now he came in to get that last little bit. He can use the full richness and go to the end. Paul? 158 laps complete. Bobby Rahal assumes the lead of the race for the moment. Michael Andretti in second, Scott Goodyear in third, Paul Tracy in fourth. Those are the only cars, those four, on the leader lap. So the game now being played by Ray Hall. Does he have enough to go to the end of the race? Let's go to Gary Gerald. Checking, Gary Gerald. In, checking in here in the uh, Goodyear pit, Derek Walker was concerned about whether or not they'd have enough fuel to go the distance. He said the pace would dictate whether they had to make a final stop. When Tracy made his stop, Goodyear gained a position. They applauded in the uh, McKenzie pit. Now he stays out. The pace slows down. They can gamble. They think he's got enough fuel. He can go the distance now, and he's running currently in third place. Big break for Scott Goodyear. Saw that big smile from Derek Walker as he was doing some calculation there. Apparently he's pleased with what he saw. 158 laps complete. We are under a caution period. The caution coming out when Mike Groff got in trouble, had a, looked like a right cooler let go in some way. In fact, remind us of Rick Mears' accident at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway that still has Rick out of contention. Let's get an update on Bobby Rahal's fuel condition from Jan Bikas. We checked in with Carl Hogan, Paul, and remember when he said if we had a few more caution laps, we could make it? They are not changing their strategy. Everybody up and down pit lane other than Ray Hall Hogan decided to come in to get fuel. Paul Hogan says we're sticking with the strategy. We know there's only four cars on the lead lap. We're going for it. We're going to try and make it to the end. Paul? This was what set off this current yellow flag condition. Look at the side pod. See the water coming out of the side pod on Mike Groff's car here. That suggests the radiator or one of the water hoses let go on the side of that car. And that's what eventually cost the engine. So now the green flag comes out once again with Bobby Rahal, the leader of the race. Michael Andretti sits in second place, but some distance back, trying to catch up with Rahal. The battle for the championship continuing here in the Bosch Park Plug Grand Prix. You get a glimpse there of Michael at a moment. He has two cars to handle up for it before he can close on to the leader, Rahal. And a great situation for Ray Hall here. Clear racetrack ahead of him and a lot of traffic between, only one car between Michael, but Tracy is embroiled in a lot of traffic. However, Emerson Fittipaldi, that's at our booth here, moved aside under yellow and waved Paul through to get on his, with his attack of Michael and Bobby. Now Michael Andretti has handled up the second of those two cars, the person of Al Unser Jr. And Michael has a clear shot at the leader of the race, Bobby Ray Hall, Paul Tracy. There he is, still involved in traffic, but the traffic he's involved with is Scott Goodyear, and that is a fight for position. Goodyear currently in third and looking for a win in this race as well. And let me tell you something on an oval, any one of these four guys still has a strong chance at taking the win. And Goodyear tries round the outside and can't quite get it done, but Tracy will pounce if the door is left even half open. Of course, that is Tracy's teammate, Al Unser, the senior, sitting just in front of Goodyear, though the Penske team says generally they don't play team tactics. Are they here today? 
There goes Goodyear down the inside, but Paul Tracy's going to try it to the outside. The gap closes very quickly. Paul Tracy smartly moves back. So Goodyear gets the traffic between himself and Paul Tracy. Oh, Tracy slices down the inside. I think Al Sr. definitely saw him because he didn't turn down. Yeah, but boy, you talk about a great move, a super move. Paul Tracy now with the quickest lap of the race at 175 miles an hour. The Quaker stayed on board camera on Scott Goodyear's car. The battle continues over on the backstretch. There's Michael, there's Goodyear, there's Tracy. So they're all in line. And Ray Hull is less than two seconds up the road ahead of Michael. The front of the field closing up. 169 laps are complete. Right at 30 laps to the end of this run now. And the wrap laps tick off so very quickly. You catch traffic very fast here. I see Tracy dodge inside Buddy Lazier in the Viper car. But you catch traffic so fast here that Ray Hall will be in the middle of it very soon. And that's an opportunity that may open up for Michael to begin to close that gap. Look how fast Michael Andretti closed on that traffic in front of him. That's here in Houston, Dick Simon's car. Bobby Ray Hall, second place. Michael is right there. Michael now slowly reeling him in, not so slowly in fact, was two seconds the interval at the last lap. It's now down to 1.2 seconds. So Michael Andretti is reeling the leader in. Oh, this is gonna be a good fight. There's Ray Hull right ahead of him. That's exactly what Michael sees. Michael's got clear road. Now that's traffic ahead of Ray Hall. That's Scott Pruitt. Ahead of Rejo, may slow him just a little bit. Lord Pruitt pulls out of the way, knows he's leading, pulls out of the way. I like to see that. That's good. Now Michael with Scott Pruitt in front of him. Bobby Ray Hall in a top points position at the moment, hoping to finish the race this way at the front of the order and taking the 20 points for first place. Michael Andretti, though, has already picked up the point for being on the pole and the point for leading the most laps. And Michael's nipped a couple of more tenths off of Bobby Rahal. He's now nine tenths back. Oh, Michael goes down the outside of Christian Danner. Went to inside first, changed his mind, and shot through the outside. You can see a great shot here. See Nikki Fonoro there, but well, you can see that really well from the in-car camera. That's what the drivers have to watch for every time they go by the start-finish line because if Nick Fonoro waves that blue flag, he's telling you, be aware there is somebody trying to make a pass. Michael Andretti lost time the past two laps, back to almost 1.9 seconds. Right at 25 laps to go in the run. This is turn two. Look, he's not flat. He just backs off a little bit, then gets in it hard. Watch how fast he slices past the traffic here. Boom. That's Emerson's good apology. See how fast Michael went by. Michael searching ahead as he comes off every corner, looking for Ray Hall. Carl Hogan can barely stand it as he stays in communication with Bobby. The question would remain. to the end. Well, it's been 62 laps since his last pit stop. So Ray Hall has the lead. Michael Andretti pursues. Scott Goodyear is third. Paul Tracy is fourth. They are all right together. We'll be back for the finish of this race. Watching as Bobby Ray Hall continues his lead over Michael Andretti, leading by four seconds now. But there's still a question of whether Ray Hall can make it all the way to the end of this race. Well, the NHL is back on ESPN, making our premier coverage of the NHL as the Philadelphia Flyers take on the Pittsburgh Penguins Tuesday at 7.30 p.m. Eastern. Don't miss it. Well, Michael, Michael Andretti still chasing, but losing ground to Ray Hall as they cycle through traffic. Let's go down to the Ray Hall pits and Jan Bikas. Paul, we've been keeping a very close eye on everything that's happening down here in Ray Hall Hogan Racing. 
They are very concerned about their fuel economy. They are radioing to Bobby Rahal, are you in sixth gear? They have to be in sixth gear. That is the fuel economy gear. They have to save everything. They're running back and forth, making those very minute calculations on the computer. Every single lap, they're checking that telemetry. Paul, they're very, very concerned. It's going to be extremely tight. I would say we'll probably see them first flash and go. And Michael Andretti is now right there at the back of Bobby Rahal's car. Rahal, very light on fuel at this moment. Michael Andretti with plenty of fuel to make it to the end of the race, which is now just 14 laps away. Keeping an eye on Rahal, Andretti would like to pass him on the track, though. He would like to make it a racer's pass and not depend on the possibility that Rahal has to roll into the pits. And Michael had a terrible run in traffic, and suddenly Rahal got the bad run. Rahal cannot get by Eddie Cheever. He tried inside, outside, and now look at this Michael. I try, Michael goes inside, Matt Schuster, Rahal goes outside. Both men driving desperately now as Michael Andretti right on the back end of Bobby Rahal looking for room to the outside as they come off of the corner. Michael Andretti trying to close with every corner. It's a battle of inches played at hundreds of miles an hour. And traffic will be the key here because Rahal is fast and he into turn three and four, which is where Michael might make an opportunity to pass. But this will be, traffic will play a major part here. Michael drops back just a bit, watching Ray Hall as he moves for the traffic. Ray Hall moves inside of Eddie Cheever, gives the car a pitch to the outside. Now Michael Andretti has Cheever just ahead. Michael needs to get by Eddie as fast as possible. Eddie needs to move over, let this lead battle get on its way. Michael gets frustrated very easily when he gets blocked, waves his fist at people regularly. Cheever obviously didn't bother him too much because he kept both hands on the wheel. As Ray Hall flashed across the line on the last lap, indication was given to him, 10 laps to go. And now Ray Hall with plenty of traffic in front of him. Michael has to handle up Buddy Lazier just in front of him. So still that single car separates him. And that's Bobby Rahal just behind Scott Brayton. Rahal looking to the inside of Brayton. Brayton clears the road, gives him room. Michael closes in, gets alongside Brayton. Michael got a great run there, but this is the flat turn one. Can't pass here. This is almost flat out in turn two. Very, very difficult to pass. The downhill run, this is going to be the key to this race. This downhill run here. Michael Andretti certainly well aware that it's been 77 laps since Ray Hall's last stop. He pushes him every chance he can get. Michael Andretti, who won the very first IndyCar race here in Nazareth. This is his last run in front of his hometown crowd before he moves over to Formula One next year. Boy, would he love a win here today, and is it possible? It just might be. It might be, and everybody in the grandstands are on their feet here cheering for Michael as Ray Hall goes round the outside of Al Jr. By themselves, Ray Hall seems to have enough speed to handle Michael, but traffic is what Michael needs to help him. As they flash across the line, it's now just five laps to go to the end of the run. If Michael Andretti is going to show anything, he must do it rather quickly. The battle for third continues as well between Scott Goodyear and Paul Tracy, as Tracy is back up on the back end of Goodyear. And Tracy trying to go around the out. Oh, he makes it around Tracy the outside of Goodyear. Tracy uses the traffic and gets Scott Goodyear and Tracy up to third place now. Michael continuing the chase for Ray Hall, but Ray Hall is a full second ahead. You have to take chances in this situation, and Michael said that earlier, he might have to take chances. You can't commit yourself to staying inside somebody. Sometimes you just have to go outside and hope that he sees you. It's a clear shot for Michael to Ray Hall now. Ray Hall, remember, can be quicker. The car is very light. There's virtually no fuel in it whatsoever. And Bobby Ray Hall just ripped a lap off at 175 point miles an hour that is the fastest lap thus far in this race by any competitor two laps to go for ray hall traffic holds him up a bit but not very long doesn't hold michael very long either as he squeezes to the outside of hiramachusta not enough traffic to help michael there's 10 car lengths between himself and ray hall that is too much as you see the white flag one lap to go for bobby ray hall will he be able to move himself back 
back into the point lead. He's looking so strong here now. The checkered flag awaits him. Michael Andretti in a last desperate drive on the backstretch to catch Bobby Rahal. But Michael Andretti appears to be totally behind the eight ball as it's Bobby Rahal that takes the win here at Nazareth. Moves back to the lead of the points with Michael Andretti going into second place. Paul Tracy screams for the line now. Finishing in third place, Scott Goodyear will finish in fourth. Well, Bobby Rahal, the businessman, the racing driver, and the car owner had everything covered that he needed today. So the battle for the championship is sealed now between Rahal and Michael. Bobby Rahal enjoying the moment. Wow, what a what a great year it has been on the short overs for this team. And do they answer back in this championship hunt? And Bobby, we've got to address the fuel concerns. How nervous or apprehensive were you in that final 30 miles or so? Well, when I saw the, uh, with 10 laps to go, when I saw my meter, I knew, you know, it was going to be close, but I felt we were going to make it. It wasn't, I wasn't biting my nails yet, but when I saw that white flag come out and Michael was a couple seconds behind, boy, I felt pretty relieved. We talk about taking chances. Did you have to take big chances in the traffic on this racetrack today yeah. to get the win? I take more chances. Uh, anytime here, you take a lot of chances, but I don't like... Uh, that's the only thing about this place is, boy, uh, I had a real close call when uh, Vitolo spun, and I was on the outside of, uh, of uh, I think it was Matsushita, and boy, I'm just saying, don't come right, don't come right, and luckily he didn't, and luckily, you know, Vitolo stayed where he was, and a lot of close calls. It came right to victory lane. Ray Hall, it savers the moment. Let's go to Jan Vikas. He said pit strategy was the key. He could make it. Bobby ran very long on fuel, but yet you had to come in for the extra stop. I don't think we did. That's that. That's what happened. I think uh, first of all, that yellow was a lot longer than it should have been, and that's what screwed us up. Uh, you know, that's what gave Bobby the opportunity to make the fuel mileage to make it to the end. Well, who makes all those calls? Like when you came in earlier on yellow, is that your decision or is that the crew? Well, I told them I was coming in, but then uh, they could have waved me out, but they didn't. They they elected to fill me up, which probably was a mistake. Thank you, Michael. Well, we've had some unhappy. Drivers this time ran at a double header. First up, of course, after the Marlborough Challenge, Bobby Rahal, not too happy with what happened to him. Michael Andretti, also a little unhappy about the yellow flag system. He felt the flags were left out too long, and whilst he was driving around, he really couldn't see there was a problem for the drivers. So that obviously has uh, made him not a happy chappy as uh, we wind up our Nazareth race for you tonight. It's been a big night, hasn't it? OK, let's have a look now at the final placings for you. There you go, Bobby Rahal. Well, he's bounced back again, as he's done right throughout this season. Whenever he's been a little bit skinny on points, he seems to be able to find the energy to come up. And the other placings there for you. And Michael Andretti now all before him, because Bobby Rahal has to finish fourth or better now to clinch the championship at Laguna Seca. There's the championship points. So Rahal again out in front from Michael Andretti. Little Al Unza, well, he goes back into uh, uh, third place now. Emerson Fittipaldi, no hope of winning the championship. Only Andretti and Little Al now can knock Bobby Rahal off. And as I said, he's just got to finish fourth or better. And that race at Laguna Seca, and Nines cameras will be there live. We'll be flying over for that. Hoping to talk to Carl Haas. We'll be talking to Michael Andretti about going into Formula One. We'll be talking to Bobby Rahal and uh, lots more IndyCar news the final round. And of course, the next time round we see the IndyCars after Laguna Seca, they'll be in Australia and Queensland on the sunny Gold Coast for the first round of the championship next year. All right, hope you've enjoyed our double headers. Re really lots of action tonight. Certainly the IndyCars providing us with plenty of, uh, well, action right throughout the uh, the doubleheader from the Marlborough Challenge and, of course, the Bosch Grand Prix from Nazareth. Till next time, from Laguna Seca, Daryl East, like all the crew here, see you next time round on Nines, Wide World of Sports. This has been another presentation from Nines, Wide World of Sports. <laughs>